time, American capitalism was supposed to just maximize the profit that the company was able to make legally and maximize profit for shareholders. And now we're talking about a lot of other layers added on top of that, about the way that companies should be thinking about how they invest to be sustainable and what investors should be looking at when they decide to invest in. So when did that start to happen and how has that developed recently? Sure, I'm happy to take that one. Um, Michael, first of all, thanks for organizing this panel discussion on ESG, which I believe is one of the most important topics in the business world today. So it's a real honor to be part of this. Uh, regarding your question, it's true that businesses are increasingly shifting from a shareholder primacy model to what is called a stakeholder capitalism model. Now, what does that mean and why is it happening? Uh, well, back in 1970, as, as many of you know, Milton Friedman published a really influential article that stated that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And that doctrine influenced a generation of executives and politicians, and it still holds sway over uh, a, a large part of the corporate world today. But perspectives are changing. And in 2019, top CEOs involved in what, what is called the business roundtable, and these include CEOs such as Jeff Bezos of Amazon, Tim Cook of Apple, Mary Barra of General Motors, and many others, um, they, they shifted the focus from shareholders to stakeholders. And they said that a corporation should benefit all stakeholders, so not just shareholders, but also employees, consumers, customers, uh, suppliers, and uh, communities as well. And so why did they shift that focus? Well, it wasn't, well, it's not out of the goodness of their hearts. And this is the, the key point that I want to emphasize tonight is that they believe, and I believe, that there's a real business case for ESG and that, um, uh, and then, and that you must take a longer term perspective and a multi-stakeholder perspective and that successful firms must gain the loyalty of key stakeholders in order to generate shareholder return. And this is because stakeholders are taking action and that action is coming back to impact the business. And I can provide some examples of that. But um, to sum up, I think it's important to emphasize that the goal of stakeholder capitalism is profitability. Um, a lot of think a lot of people think that it's it, you know social prosperity, but no, we're talking about profitability. We're talking about short-term profitability. We're talking about longer-term profitability, and the way to achieve that is through a multi-stakeholder approach. Okay, thanks. I was wondering if we could get started also by talking about what the actual letters stand for in ESG and and where those concerns come in. So, Teresa, would you mind talking a little bit about where? the environment part, part of ESG comes in and what that means for the way you look at it as an investment advisor. So one of the key um, environmental issues that we look at um, and that many of our investors are most concerned about is uh, climate change. And you can incorporate climate related issues into your portfolio in a number of different ways. So you can exclude companies that are climate offenders, such as fossil fuel companies and utilities that burn coal, for example, you can exclude those from your portfolio. You can increase your exposure to renewable energy type companies in your portfolio. And you can focus on, on uh, proxy voting and corporate actions companies so that you can influence their ability to uh, to make ch changes and to you know realize their climate commitment. So we've seen lots of climate commits by 2030 we're going to do this, but do you have a plan to do that? And that's a lot of what our proxy and corporate actions efforts are focused on. So companies outside, the fossil fuel industry outside uh, traditional environmental offenders will focus there. Um, environmental issues can also include mining, forestry, and other types of companies where you can take the same path, where you can um, either exclude them from your portfolio if that's what you choose to do, if you feel strongly that you do not want to own those companies, 
or you can own those companies and then influence them through proxy voting and corporate actions. So the environment uh, covers all the things we would expect it to, including plastics in the ocean and things like that. Uh, and we try to incorporate um, all of the, those issues into portfolios if that's what uh, investors like to do. Okay. Catherine, would you be willing to take on the S part of ESG of and what sure. concerns so the, them S, the S stands? The S stands for social, and that includes uh, the workers, which are employees and also uh, supply chain workers. It also includes customers and communities. And so some of the issues that might be factored into the S uh, part of ESG includes, uh, you know, a, a company's license to operate and is a community potentially uh, protesting that? And what does that cost to the business? Um, also, is, is the company and the suppliers at the global scale, is it, are, are, they, are they paying a livable wage? Um, and if not, you know, workers might leave. They might view these jobs as, as transactional. They might leave. And then that turnover is a cost to the firm. Uh, another really important issue that has surfaced a lot over the last year is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, is, does the company have a strategy around that? Are they implementing it well and meeting their targets? And there's some research that shows that uh, if you if you have a very diverse workforce and you're working hard to retain them and and promote an inclusive environment, you might have faster problem solving ability. You might have um, better decision making and more creativity overall. OK, great. Steve, you want to take on the G? What is the governance part of it? And does that really only become an internal thing or how does the outside investor come to care about that part of ESG? Steve, looks like you're on mute. Would you mind uh, unmuting? That's okay. Sure. Um, the G stands Thank for you. governance factors of decision making. Um, so those include things like board composition and structure, which is more internal, um, but also includes things like risk management, cybersecurity, um, which can be more external. Um, if you're an investor, you want to be on the same page in terms of risk management. Um, so governance is a very broad topic as well. Um, it's often overlooked. But it's really one of the more important uh, ESG topics, if you can um, say that um, ESG raters often give governance um, one of the highest ratings. Um, they do separate ratings based upon E factors, S factors, and G factors, a lot of them do. Um, so um, there, there's a lot to uh, dig into with, with uh, governance factors. If I could just jump in there, one really yeah. important governance issue that came up recently was and you know, it was in all the newspapers, so everyone probably knows about this, was that Tesla was dropped from one of the major ESG indices. And it was not dropped because it's not producing um, a vehicle that is an electric vehicle that um, you know, factors into the whole climate change issue. It was dropped because of governance issues, because of the way um, the board is structured because of the, you know, the way the shares are structured. Um, and that, I think that's really important. It's that, you know, governance is the issue that came up there, not environment or social issues. Although, you know, you could argue that social issues might come up at Tesla as well. So, and the governance part of that is that, is the argument that they are not allowing uh minority shareholders or certain classifications of shareholding any voice in how Tesla is operating? I, yes, I believe that was one of the key issues, but you know, a, a large portion of the, the shares are controlled by one person, as we all know, Elon Musk. Um, and that was part of the issue. Um, and you know, he tends to make most of the decisions. So, but, you know, it was just, and I, to me, that was just an interesting fact that, you know, Tesla was removed from a sustainability index when many of us think it's one of the companies that is contributing a lot to um, the future. So just thought I'd bring it up. No, that's great. Teresa, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about something you had mentioned in a conversation earlier, that there are some current proxy fights that either are going on or are about to go on with both uh, hospitality companies and with some 
franchises who rely on real frontline workers, uh, restaurant type workers related to what's been going on in our lives for the last couple of years now, which is COVID and the question of whether they are treating their employees in a way that gives them access to sick leave and other benefits. Um, what, how is that battle going to be fought? What power can the people who vote that those shares bring to bear on a company like that or on an industry like that? Yeah, so one of the issues that we've really been focusing on is paid sick leave for employees. And that issue is important, not only for the employees themselves, but also for the companies. Um, if you have a better sick leave policy, you're more likely to be able to retain employees and therefore operate more efficiently. And also for society, a lot of the employees at um, in the hospitality industry were showing up to work even though they were sick because they just couldn't afford to take off. So you have all three um, groups that would benefit from improved sick leave policies, particularly in the hospitality and food service industries. So we had a targeted effort that focused initially on communicating our views and the views of uh, various partners that work with us uh, to managements, having conversations with managements, and in two cases that did um, that did help us to move these issues forward within the companies. Um, and you know, this year we've moved on to um, food service companies and we're focusing there. Okay. So tell me a little bit more about how you go about doing that. Um, you, you've decided at first affirmative, uh, you've sort of taken the temperature of your investors and what your philosophy is as a company and as an investment manager, and you gather together with other people who are like-minded and then you take it to the company somehow to try to get them to act on it. But how do you do that? How do you physically and, and socially go about doing that? So initially it would be um, by reaching out to the management of the company. So, you know, our, uh, the, uh, the clients that we work with um, tend to want to focus on issues like paid sick leave, uh, like, you know, implementing environmental protocols, like, you know, linking um, climate commitments to executive compensation. So our investors um, really do want us to focus on those issues. So that's the first step. The second step is that we have very stringent uh, proxy voting guidelines and our clients can elect first affirmative to vote their proxies. So we look at, at holding shares as the impact of ownership. The impact of ownership is um, put out there through proxy voting and through corporate actions. And when we say corporate actions, it's really reaching out to management, writing letters, getting other like-minded investors on board to move forward with us. Um, and we've had significant success there. Okay. And is it fair to say that shares are votes and when you gather together enough shares, you've got enough voting power to have the company actually start paying attention? Absolutely. And, you know, the key is to get some of the very large players in the industry on board with um, your, you know, your issue with the issue that you want to move forward. Um, and there have been some very significant wins, particularly um, on climate related issues um, over the past several years. Okay. Catherine, could you talk a little bit about what it looks like more from the company's perspective um, in terms of when they have to start paying attention and what it's been like for corporate world to start realizing that it's no longer just about the profit, but that there's some new things they have to pay attention to. Has that been a uh, tough sell to them in some ways? Right. Well, again, I think it's really important to emphasize the business case. I do lead the Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility, so I believe very strongly in the moral case for this as well. But um, but I think to drive change at scale, it's important to, to talk about the numbers, right, and um, what, what's in it for, for the business and for the shareholders at the end of the day. And so, um, and so I think 
the the concept of materiality is highly relevant to ESG. And what that means is that um, the E and the S and the G um, can all, or a lot of it can be quantifiable in a way that impacts the, the, um, the financial return to the shareholders. And so, for instance, I worked at Chevron, and this was a long time ago. However, um, we did used to quantify the days of uh, work stoppages due to community protests around the world. That's not something that Chevron includes in, in its corporate social responsibility report. However, it's something that really gets the executive's attention internally and will drive them to, um, to take the S factor more seriously. So I think there are a lot of examples across the corporate world of that when when the um, when the when the data is analyzed and is demonstrated to affect the financial returns um, you know there's there's momentum there to, to take these issues very seriously so Steve can you talk a little bit about how we start measuring these things or how they did start measuring them um, how do they how do companies keep track how do outside people keep track and what do government regulators who always have something to say about this like the SEC, how do they get involved? Yeah, yeah. The, the reporting of ESG data is a, a very important part of the process. Um, and reporting started uh, being more and more widespread in the 90s. Um, back then, the, the term was a uh, corporate social responsibility, CSR. Uh, the terminology has changed. Uh, and um, more recent years, the BESG, um, that term uh, was coined uh, in 2004 by the, uh, the UN. Um, but there are multiple types of ESG frameworks and standards. And these frameworks and standards basically tell companies what they should disclose um, among different ESG uh, criteria. Um, so there's a few big ESG frameworks and standards. Uh, there's the SASB, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, that is more shareholder focused. So they're looking at things that are financially material, decision useful, and cost effective to report. So this is super useful for shareholders um, because theoretically, if companies do these things well, this could lead to increased uh, profitability and uh, long-term wealth um, for the, the company. Um, but there's other types of frameworks and standards. One is GRI, which is the Global Reporting Institute. This is more of a stakeholder focused um, ESG framework. Um, so this, um, kind of looks at all stakeholders, including just the community at large, um, and sees what is important for them to dis disclose. And uh, financial materiality is a big part of that. Um, usually for GRI, you start with um, a materiality mapping where you're looking at things that are increasingly important for business success and increasingly important for your stakeholders. Um, so that is kind of where you disclose your information there. Um, GRI doesn't have industry specific guidance where SASB provides industry specific guidance. And uh, the, the newest change in uh, ESG reporting is that at the COP26 conference, uh, they announced the formation of the ISSB, which stands for the International Sustainability Standards Board. So this board um, is overseen by the IRF IFRS Foundation, and it's a, a global um, framework. Um, so right now they just have exposure drafts out for this framework. Um, but in the, the coming year or so, um, it's expected to uh, come uh, in a finalized form. Um, and this is really useful just because one of the criticisms of ESG reporting is that it's voluntary and there isn't um, one framework that companies use. So companies often use multiple frameworks um, and th there's a lot of flexibility right now um, in terms of uh, ESG reporting. And do you get companies coming to you just sort of who are starting from scratch, who just didn't know that this, these are things they had to worry about. And you have a lot of education to do in what they now need to start reporting and how that gets done. Yeah, and, and definitely education is uh, the first part uh, to start with. Um, public companies have been early adopters of ESG reporting. Uh, now, private equity companies um, and other privately held companies are uh, starting to look at ESG um, in a serious way. So it's, it's across the board. Okay. Um, Teresa, when you are if, if working with an individual investor, you have your company and other companies have built different screens that people can have. If I come in as an investor and say, 
you know, I really care about guns. I really care about uh, employees getting good health insurance. Um, I really care about climate change. How do you walk them through? What have you created that helps them walk through and screen out what is important to them and then rates the companies that they might be interested in investing in? So we have developed a strategy. It's called a values aligned direct index solution that allows investors to identify the values that they care about most using a questionnaire that was that has been developed by our partner, Your Stake. And with that values questionnaire, we can identify the specific issues that an individual client cares about. So for example, if your top priorities are environmental issues and diversity or female empowerment, those are the issues that you can have reflected in your portfolio. And we will create a client specific investment universe that incorporates those issues into the portfolio and then build a portfolio that is aligned with your financial objectives and deliver that portfolio to you. Um, so this is a new strategy um, that we've been developing over the past couple of years. And it really does allow individual clients to align their investments with the things they care most about, as opposed to the things I care most about, which may or may not be the same as the things our clients care most about. So that, you know, we feel that that's a big step forward because it allows true values alignment. And we've made it very accessible because we we're building portfolios for clients that have as little as $25,000 to invest. So we work with advisors and their clients, and those are the types of portfolios we're able to deliver now. Okay. Um, and who decides, and any, any of you can take on this question, but who has then done the ratings on those companies to go through what they are doing and saying, yes, company X does provide great health insurance for their employees. Therefore they get a gold star and company Y is really not providing much. They provide the bare minimum. And so they're getting silver bronze or star or worse. And so they're not going to be as high on our scale. So one of, one of the things that we've really focused on is how do we choose an ESG data provider? So there are you know, a few very large organizations out there that score companies based on ESG ratings. Um, they can have completely different ratings on the same company. What we're doing is working with an organization. Again, their name is Your Stake. And they do not score. They call it no score ESG ratings. They're identifying the best sources of data for each company, for each industry, and providing lists of companies that are on, that are associated with those, with, with specific topics or categories. So for example, if you want to include more companies that have higher percentage of women on boards in your portfolio, we can do that. If you want to include companies that are in the renewable energy space, we can do that. If you want to exclude all fossil fuel companies from your portfolio, we can do that. And then we can prove that we're doing that by delivering um, an impact performance report. So we can show you that that portfolio is aligned with your values. So it's really a very integrated process and the data is extremely well researched. And that's the reason that we've chosen this particular data data provider. Okay. Catherine, do companies ever protest the way that they've been rated or you know where they show up on these different screens and say, that's really not fair, that we don't deserve that? Um, or do they want to fly under the radar, they're happy to not be mentioned? No, definitely. I think well, I think it's a combination of both, depending on what the issues are and whether how much attention they want to garner to these issues. 
Um, but you definitely see both. I think the point that, that I wanted to raise is just around, um, you know, it's great, Teresa, to hear that there, there, there's a lot of, you know, good data you feel and there's a, there are some great processes out there. There have been some recent articles, at least in academia, there was one uh, written by Ken Pucker, um, the former COO of Timberland in the Harvard Business Review recently. And he called, he called this garbage in, <laughs> garbage out. And he was just talking about how a lot of this data is from the companies is self-reported and then um, the reporting agencies mix it into this cauldron and add a couple of things, do analysis, and, uh, and you get this uh, potion coming out. Um, so I think all of that is just to say that uh, from my perspective and a lot of the, the faculty here at the Leeds School of Business that I've talked to, I, I think this is very much a, a work in progress and uh, a, a, you know, we, we need to learn a lot and advance the thinking and uh, we clearly need a lot more data as well. Teresa, how do we prevent it from being garbage in, garbage out? I mean, do you feel like as you go through different companies, there is a lot of noise in there and it's hard to sort through? Well, again, that's one of the reasons that we're not using specific scores on companies. So, for example, the MSCI ratings, uh, their data is the data that they're using is extensive. And I'm sure a lot of it is very, very good. But you know, it is self-reported data and self-reported data tends to be um, reported so that it portrays you in the best light. So, you know, for example, if you're putting diversity data into um, the cauldron and spinning it around and trying to make it come out, say that you have more um, women or under represented minorities in leadership positions, then you can make that. You just have to, you know, change a few titles around and you, you've got your answer. Um, so it's really important in my view to focus on external sources. Um, you know, one of our, um, you know, again, women on boards is one where you, you can get that data. It exists. You can see if, a company has no women on their board, or if you know they have one and the board is comprised of 22 people. Um, so you can really go into detail like that with real data that is not, you know, it's reported by the companies, but it's out there and in proxies so you can check it. And that's the type of data that we would prefer to depend on. And Catherine, you I have talked and we've all talked together about the difference between real change and window dressing and how you define those things. Um, when you're looking at a board, for example, and maybe you see one member board, you think, well, that's not a 50-50 in the ideal world, but more on the executive committee. Um, is that one thing you need to keep track of? And is that the kind of thing that is that is transparent enough as things stand now? Yes, definitely. Um, it's, it's really important for companies to try to move away from greenwashing. I think there's so much of it out there. And, uh, and, and you know, the way I define greenwashing is when you're investing more into marketing, communicating an effort than doing the hard work of actually driving positive social and environmental impacts. Um, and I think everyone, you know, everyone's really struggling with this and there's no gold standard out there. But, uh, but yeah, definitely there are some key targets, I think, in the, in the area of E, you know, climate, climate risks, and with S, with diversity, equity, inclusion, and um, with G, with how decisions decisions are made. Like, there are some key targets out there that I think are really important for all companies to uh, to think about and factor into their strategies across the board. I think this is a C-suite conversation, um, and so I think it's also really important not to silo ESG into like one department, but really think about how, how it can be integrated across the board of a company. And Steve, what role do the number crunchers play in making sure that that is done fairly, that's done openly, that uh, do you play a role in making sure that, or talking to the companies about their changes being real as opposed to window dressing, as opposed to just checking a box? Yeah, um, and the SEC has been really cracking down on greenwashing, um, or at least uh, there's been a few instances. Um, BNY Mellon um, a month ago uh, was fined 
um, for their fund um, that was ESG related. Um, and there, there's, we're seeing um, more of that where ESG funds um, aren't doing what they're saying that they're doing. Um, so that's definitely a good rule of thumb um, across the board is say what you're doing and don't say anything else. Um, and you know where accounting comes into play is you report on things that you're doing. Um, so as uh, Catherine was saying, just really focusing on things where um, the strategy aligns with the ESG, um, that, that's a great place to start. Um, and what your stakeholders want from the company, um, that, that's a great place to start. And uh, accountants um, both do uh, some of the reporting um, and then also uh, attestation of ESG data is uh, being more and more important. Um, so right now there's no attestation requirements, which is the auditing of ESG data. Um, but the SEC uh, climate disclosure rule um, that was proposed would have attestation requirements. And there's two types of that. There's the limited um, assurance, which is a, a lower bar. Um, and then there's the reasonable assurance, which is what we think of more when we think of a financial statement audit. And uh, the vast majority of ESG data out there does not have reasonable assurance um, with the uh, ESG data. Um, so that, that I think we'll see some growth there in the future related to that. And that's uh, the accounting profession will be a part of the, the attestation uh, of the ESG data. Okay. Teresa, you, I think, uh, in the past at least have also advised more uh, aggregated investors, institutional investors, uh, people with um, foundation money to invest that might have um, more money at stake than an individual would. And in Colorado, of course, we have a lot of oil and gas companies, a lot of oil and gas to, and divestment from fossil fuels is obviously been a big movement on campuses, especially, and among other socially conscious funds. Um, how have you all handled that and how have you seen that play out in terms of um, institutions gathering together and to, considering whether fossil fuel divestment is something that's one of the things they want to consider? So I think those institutions um, have considered it. Um, it's, it. Many institutions are not going all the way toward we are going to exclude every fossil fuel company from our portfolio. Um, and we can accommodate both, you know, partial exclusion of fossil fuel companies and a more extreme version of that where you're excluding including fossil fuel company, fossil fuel producers, exploration companies, and, and um, all of that entire industry, plus um, utilities that, that produce, uh, that consume um, coal and uh, even natural gas in some cases. Um, so it, it really depends on the client themselves. And we allow them to dictate to us what um, level of fossil fuel exclusions they want, what level of climate commitments they want companies to have that are in their portfolio. Again, we're, we're looking at individual preferences as opposed to saying, you know, this is what you should do. Okay. Um, Ken, I'm curious what it looks like from you mentioned in your when we introduced you that you are making the connections between the different stakeholders and um, helping you have the university be kind of a bridge in that way. Do a lot of companies still need to be convinced that this is something they need to worry about? Uh, what was it like at Chevron when you know, being a major fossil fuel company? Obviously, um, what kind of convincing does it still take? And is that a role that um, universities also play? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thanks, Michael. First of all, just on the divestment piece, um, you know, I, I've only been at the university for a couple of months, so I haven't been involved in any of those conversations. But I, I, there is a movement here at the at CU Boulder um, to divest. I've, I've heard a lot recently about how divestment is not the best approach. That engagement is what we should be persuading some of the younger and uh, younger generations to do. Let's have these conversations. Let's vote. Let's get involved. Um, so, anyways, I just wanted to share that perspective. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so again, I think that it's really important. When I was at Chevron and I worked there for several years on corporate social responsibility initiatives, um, we, we always tried to demonstrate how 
uh, whatever environmental or social um, a project we were we were uh, planning to do with a nonprofit organization or um, just with company investment dollars that how it contributed to the company's bottom line. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, you know, worker stoppages is, is an example that I shared, you know, if communities are protesting and the roads closed, that impacts operations and you can quantify it. Um, I'll also say there's also a business case to be made at large multinationals. And I made this when I was at Chevron around um, building up local supply chains. So how do you work with communities so that they can supply the industries rather than importing products and services um, uh, from, from other countries? How can we build up the local supplier system and, and really create a win-win for the company because you're, you know, you're saving costs, but you're also um, having a positive local impact on society, which contributes to, um, you know, employee well-being and happiness and uh, and local support for operations and, and that license to operate at the end of the day. So I think that whatever company, whatever industry you're in, you kind of have to think strategically about the E, S, and the G and how is it going to um, contribute to the bottom line. One, one point I want to add, since I am in the university and I engage a lot with younger generations, is that there's a strong business case to be made for how um, you know younger generations, Gen Z, millennials, um, they you know they, they're going to vote with their dollars, and they care very deeply about climate. Um, they make purchasing decisions. I think 20, 25 percent have said that they made purchasing decisions based on environmental factors. Um, they're also choosing companies to work for based on their values, and this is a key characteristic of uh, Gen Z. And when I say Gen Z, I'm talking about um, people between the ages of nine and 24. So some of them are already in the workforce, but they're all going into it pretty soon. And, and some of them are already key consumers for companies. Um, they're all going to be key consumers. And, you know, this generation is going to have more power. It's going to have more information than, than its predecessors. And, uh, and it's also going to have a lot of wealth. They're inheriting, I think I just read, they're inheriting $40 trillion um, by 2040 from the baby boomers. And so they're going to have a lot of wealth to invest and, and they are going to help determine which companies make it or break it. And that is part of the business case as well as companies take this longer term perspective. Um, they really have to factor in these younger generations into, into their E, S and G approaches. You start to convince, I guess, the company, let's, let's say you're an airline and they're a 19 year old who's flying for spring break. And are they really making their decision? A lot of inflation in airline prices right now and in price per seat. Are they really making a decision about whether to fly home or what airline to fly home to New Jersey on? Uh, the How much sustainable fuel they're using as a percentage, whether they're considered a green airline or not, or are they making the choice between, it's gonna cost me a thousand bucks on airline A and it's only costing me 750 on airline B. Um, do we know yet how much this actually does influence consumer behavior and then corporate behavior? I, no, I was going to say, like, this is exactly the type of decision making analysis that I think needs to be done at the uni university level and, and in other places as well. Um, you know, there, there, there's been a lot of analysis and you can find a lot of research that shows that um, ESG is often correlated with financial performance. But in terms of showing that, uh, you know, an ESG firm or so, a firm that takes these factors as seriously as possible is going to perform financially well over the long term, it's difficult, at least at this point, to show causation. So I think that question about that that student and whether to fly home, like we need data around that and we need to understand how these key, um, key, key younger generations and other key consumers uh, are making these decisions. And I, I think it's, it would be really interesting to see a study where the price is the same. So both flights were $150. And which airline would the student or would that young person choose then? And normally it would be based um, on customer service. And that is a direct function of the way the airline treats its, its So you can't, there are certain things that can be measured. And there have been many studies on the a while ago, I haven't seen any recently where you know, Southwest dramatically outperformed the airline industry. And it was because its customer service was so far superior to other airlines. 
I don't know if that holds anymore, but there are a, a lot of different ways that you can prove that, um, you know, ESG factors are financial factors. And, you know, that's really the message I think that should be, um, that people should be teaching out there to this younger generation. Okay, so Teresa, I wanted to ask follow up from the investor's perspective, not necessarily the consumer's perspective. But if I'm one of your investors and I come in and uh, you are talking to me about what my values are, but I'm wondering, but wait, if I invest in a bunch of solar panel makers and they all go bankrupt in the next year or three quarters of them do, um, can you show me that having a really serious, you know, pro investment screen? is going to get me comparable returns. Um, is comparable returns a phrase that you use a lot and that you can show to people can be done? So I can't comment directly on solar manufacturers, but yeah, I, what I can again. comment on is that the index that is basically the industry standard and has been since 1990 when it was introduced is the uh, KLD index. It was formerly the Domini uh, Social Index. And that index um, over, you know, since inception, so since 1990, has outperformed the S&P 500 by 100 basis points per year. And for all of our portfolios, we're not using um, an ESG-oriented index or a sustainable index because there are lots of them out there that you can choose from and you can kind of game the system if you start doing that. We use um, as, as our benchmarks the standard indexes. So whether it's the S&P 500 or the MSCI All Country World Index or the you know called the ACWI, um, we're using standard benchmarks to compare the performance of our portfolios, of our clients' portfolios. So I think it's, you know, really important for people to do that. Um, you know, we're in the investment business. Our job is to deliver investment performance. And that has to be the starting point for everything we do. Um, and the environmental, social, and governance issues that our clients choose to put into those portfolios um, really allow us to deliver impact performance and investment performance. Okay, perhaps prompted by our discussion about what airline to fly home on on spring break or summer break, uh, someone is asking, is there an airline, which airlines are considered sustainable airlines? Do some without, obviously you guys don't have to endorse a specific one, but just in general, do some airlines have a reputation as working harder on these issues than others? And if so, is it on the environment? Is it on the way they treat their employees? Uh, and what screen would you use? Who wants to take that on? Teresa, you want to mention that or Catherine? Uh, I'm afraid that I can't answer that question right now. So <laughs> I can get back to whoever answered it and whoever asked it and, and I can you know, do some research on it, but I don't okay. know the answer. It's going to be the future okay. solar paneled airline. <laughs> 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 all electric one <laughs> i know they've all made climate commitments at this point that's the one thing i do know is that all the major air airlines have made you know the 2030 climate commitment but i don't know who's furthest along in meeting that commitment the, the most energy efficient airline is the uh the one that has the newest fleet um and in fact uh, one of the airlines uh, based here in denver um so they, they tout themselves as uh being more sustainable um, but I mean, in terms of airlines, there hasn't been a lot of breakthroughs when it comes to sustainable fuel in terms of uh, the economics of that. Um, so, I mean, I think for the airline industry, investing in uh, research and development is probably the, the most important thing right now. Okay. okay. Well, I can say from our perspective of reporting, we actually have reported on private jet centers in, in Colorado starting to use sustainable aviation fuel. And doing that reporting, we also learned that United, as one of the major name airlines, certainly talks about sustainable aviation fuel more than the others and buys. It's a very limited supply right now, so it can't supply that much. But United buys a lot of what's available. So if that helps answer the question. But otherwise, you can email us and we'll have to research and get back to you personally if you need to know more about that. But any other examples you all want to raise about specific things that have happened where you have seen 
outside pressure, outside proxy fights really make a difference in how companies are behaving, whether it's the recent fight with uh, Disney and the state of Florida, um, other things that, Teresa, you guys have been involved in with, I know you've been involved in the Washington football team in the past and their sponsorships and the major companies that are involved in buying sponsorships with them. Steve, uh, anybody who wants to name a specific company, I'd be interested in hearing about where you've seen success. Nothing specifically comes to mind. Do you want to talk about labor disputes and labor organization and how how the companies get rated on that? I mean, Starbucks and Amazon are in huge fights right now in terms of um, whether they're going to allow unionization or fight it tooth and nail and whether those companies, those big multi-employer companies are going to end up being unionized. Um, is that something that comes into these screens? Which screen would it be? So there are there are um, specific screens that allow you to look at um, supply chain sustainability and corporate um, employee policies. Um, so you know, yeah, there there are specific screens for that. Um, I I don't know that I can give you examples of companies that are doing better or worse than other companies in in those areas, though. Okay. Uh, we do have a reader question that talks about um, local governments being involved where they have to interact with corporations and they have issues both for their residents, but then they also can make policy decisions that affect the company. And their example in the chat is Vail Resorts, which has been in the news a lot lately, um, ended up raising their wages quite a bit in the middle of the ski season this year because they were getting uh, terrible reviews for customer service and the way that they were serving people. And they realized, or they said publicly that they realized one of the reasons what happened was they couldn't, they weren't paying their people enough to um, come to work every day and also have housing. And Vail, the town of Vail's in fights with uh, Vail Resorts about where to build affordable housing. So do you see that happening as affordable housing becomes a bigger and bigger issue that local governments have to interact with the corporations in a lot more meaningful way? Yeah, I'll just say over, overall, I think one of the things we teach at, at our center is that uh, companies that have really clear values that are front and center um, and they adhere to those values and uh, all, you know, all the stakeholders understand the values, at least definitely the employees should know all the values. Um, I think those those firms tend to be, you know, really successful in retaining their employees and coming up with like really creative uh, products and services. And, and there is data around this. And I think that the, the companies, um, not just in terms of having values-based leadership, but also uh, having collaborations, I think with, with the public sector, that, and, and, and not necessarily, and having clear values, collaborations, but not going through the back door and then lobbying in contrast to those values, um, you know, doing something different than, than they're saying, um, you know, that is, that is best practice. That is what we advocate for in um, in our center. Steve, I was gonna ask you about, you know, we don't always have to keep using Vail as the example, but they've been, they have been in the news a lot lately. Um, there's been an issue about an area where they wanted to build affordable housing. Um, they own a lot of resorts around the country. This one happened to be in Vail. And local governments and local advocates said, no, that's a wildlife area. We don't want you to build there. So do, how do companies disclose or how do they make the argument for themselves if they feel that what they wanted to try to do to become an ESG responsible company was being blocked by a local government or blocked by forces beyond their control? And how do they account for that? Yeah, um, certainly ESG reports, especially for these larger public companies, are growing um, longer and longer. Um, so there's a the data table in the back, typically, that has all the raw data. Um, but then the, the majority of the report is typically narrative focused. Um, so in that part of the ESG report is where the companies can kind of tell um, what is going on kind of in more detail about the, the cup, um, about uh, everything else going on. Um, and certainly like biodiversity is uh, one of the ESG factors um, that companies are reporting on um, and stuff like uh, wildlife areas is an important part of that. Um, deciding where to drill um, is, is an important uh, area 
of ESG for oil and gas companies. Okay. Um, Just on that yeah, question, the question about uh, Vail Resorts and um, you know, the government stepping in, I, mean, I think a lot of um, not only in the resorts and building low income housing, um, raising wages and all of those things, but in other areas um, where you know, ESG factors come into play, um, building a chemical plant, um, drilling or all of those things, I mean, you get the community wanting to have these th things. So, of course, in Vail, they want additional employees, service at restaurants and hotels, and, and you know, the entire ski resort is better. But they don't want to be, to, to be forced to build low income or employee housing in a place that's adjacent to um, where you know, the mansion is. So it's, it's really interesting because this is, it was called not in my backyard syndrome mm -hmm. um, when it had to do with chemical plants and oil refineries. And now we're seeing the same thing in resort areas where the expansion of those resort areas, especially during the pandemic, has gotten to the point that you know, everything is so expensive that you can't afford to live in the area that you're working in. Right. And so where does that, which part of your screen, or which part of ESG does that fall into? And how can companies prove that they're trying to do better on it? Um, I'm going to be honest and say we don't have any screens that are geared toward um, local government in intervention in corporate decisions. Um, and that would be more the financial factors come to play. Because if you can't hire enough employees and your service is going down, ultimately that will impact your business. Okay. So, you know, so obviously we're looking at both financial factors and ESG factors and putting them all together. But this is a clear example of where, you know, ESG factors, these social factors are going to impact the bottom line. Okay, so we'll work on that NIMBY screen um, as part of our efforts in the future. But we also have another listener question about corporate lobbying money and where that falls into all this. And now we're getting into heavily into the political season right now. So corporations that might have a political action committee or contribute money or its executives contribute a lot of personal money to political action committees. So where does that fall into this in terms of keeping track and transparency? Um, Teresa or Steve, you want to take that on first. Uh, how big a factor is that? Is it more than it used to be? So, so it is a factor and there are screens that um, allow you to look at which companies um, are contributing the most. Um, and there are, you can go a level deeper. You can see which companies are contributing the most to whom. Okay. So they do exist. Steve, anything that you guys get involved in in terms of corporate lobbying money and uh, keep, keeping track of that? Yeah, it's not the most common uh, ESG disclosure, um, but I'm sure it's certainly out there. Um, similar, um, the tax that a company pays to government, um, some companies are disclosing that um, as well, especially as uh, more companies um, um, get spotlight for paying no or very low corporate tax. Okay. Well, it looks like we're getting near the end of our hour. And so I wanted to offer each of you the chance to talk to our listeners, um, address them as either investors or people who are involved in companies. And we've had some great questions from people who do try to hold meetings every month on ESG and get buy-in from their own companies. Um, what would you want them to know? What would you want them to think about in the coming year in terms of how they should think about their investments and how they want their companies to change and whether they have some power over it? Teresa, you want to go first? Sure. Um, I would just say, as you're making investment decisions, think about how you personally want to change the world and align your investments with those values. And then choose an investment advisor that will enable you to do that and achieve your financial objectives simultaneously. Steve, what do you think people should be thinking about with their own money or in their own companies and as they look at ESG questions? 
Yeah, each individual person has a uh, power. You have uh, spending dollars. Um, you choose the companies that you support. You choose uh, where you want to work. Um, you choose how you invest. Um, so that that's a, a core um, part of the ESG. Um, and uh, businesses are composed of people. Um, so, um, you know, businesses will change. I'm sure ESG will change um, to meet society's needs um, in the future. Catherine, what will you be working on or what will you be talking to people about in the next few months in terms of looking at ESG? Yeah, so at CU Boulder's Lead School of Business, we are launching a new ESG integration pathway for students. We'll have a lot of speakers coming in. Um, we, we plan to host a lab as well so that we can really do more, gather more data and do more analysis and have more of the types of case studies, Michael, that you were asking about. Um, just to just try to see if we can understand how that college student makes those makes that decision, and uh, and really try to to influence um, more companies to become ESG firms and, and understand how that drives financial performance at the end of the day. So we we welcome everyone's involvement. Great, thanks, Catherine Wendell from Center for Ethics and Social Responsibility at CU Boulder's Lead School of Business, Teresa Gusman from First Affirmative Financial Network. Steve Wilkerson from Forbis, we really appreciate your time, spending time with us tonight, and we'll pass on more questions if we get them from our audience. Directly to you all, we want to thank our sponsors one more time, which is Forbis and MB Law, and thanks especially to Eric Lubers and Christina Pritchett for making this work tonight, and everybody at the Colorado Sun. Thanks all for listening, and you can continue to watch and continue to promote it on YouTube and the other channels. So thanks again for everybody's time. Good night.